in an earlier interview by telephone today, Amplat CEO Chris Griffith told CNBC Africa that the company will consider all suggestions on how to minimize the impact of its restructuring plans on job losses and shaft closes. This after Amplat's reversed its earlier plans to put uh, that would have seen 14,000 jobs lost. So the period we, we uh, made mention of in our statement saying that this consultation process would take no more than 60 days and at the end of that process then the section 189 process would recommence. So it's not a, it's not a dramatic increase in the amount of time plus some of this work that we would have done in any event in the section 189 process will be done up front. Mm -hmm. So it's not anticipated that this would substantially delay the process. Um, there is a there's a small small team that has been put together from each of the the unions, the Department of Mineral Resources, and ourselves, that'll help coordinate this process. Um, I guess it'll be under the chairmanship of uh, of the DMR. But then what we would do, those teams would then identify from within within the the various constituents uh, who should be part of the team. So, for example, if there's a, a finance um, Yep. The task team, then there would be more financial people, I guess, and then those teams would identify if there was a need for specialists and uh, and if so, then who those specialists would be. But it's the small team that will actually decide that. Now, if the task team comes up with a different solution to the one that Amplatz has already put on the table with regarding uh, mothballing of certain shafts and, of course, uh, the intention to sell the union mine, uh, would Amplatz be prepared to relook at its plans already presented? Again, I think it's important to understand, I mean, we've spent a year looking at, um, at the various aspects. So we, we think we've got, uh, I think we, we think we understand the issues. We understand um, what, uh, what is driving the, the company and the industry to the low levels of profitability that we're seeing at the moment. But the, the whole notion of that these are proposals and that they would be discussed um, in, a, in a forum where there is consultation means that the company... Um, means that we have to be able to be open to alternative suggestions. So that's exactly the, the mindset that we have always envisaged this consultation process to be in. If there are better ideas, I mean, there may be additional ideas from government, for example, that, that, could, um, that could play a part. Um, but all of those would have to happen at the, um, in, within the consultation process. So yeah. we go into the consultation process, having done a huge amount of work, but uh, remain open to alternative suggestions. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I think it's important to note that you know this, th there is still a number. You know, the industry is in a lot of difficulty, and the fact is that there's a number of shafts, not only in our company, but also outside of our company, that uh, these shafts are not profit making. So I think it is important to note that we will listen to alternative suggestions. But the fact is that. You know, um, they need to be able to offer alternatives in the short term that can make a difference. But it is with that mindset that we go into the consultation process. Of course, that was Chris Griffith speaking there earlier to Samantha Loring. Now, joining us to discuss the lessons that can be drawn from the recent uh, controversy is Dr. Araja Bedian. He's the CEO of Pan African Investment Holdings. He's also joined by Claude Baziak. He's the executive director of Unomics. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here. You. Dr. Abedian, you've heard Mr. Griffiths. We are open to suggestions. We will listen to alternatives. How open um, will they really be? I think by the virtue of the fact that it's a uh, participatory open process, if government or labor comes up with a suggestion that makes sense and rescues uh, one shaft ideally or a few hundred jobs, they've got to listen. And I don't think that as a business they would be averse to it. Now for a moment I don't think that business would take joy in having to lay off workers. So mm -hmm. um, they would have, importantly, they would have had to do it in any case but not now. They mm -hmm. would have do it, They would have gone through the Labor Relations Act, the uh, CCMA, set up a process, and then go through the same motion. Of course, now that the DMR has insisted to get involved, well, they've got to open the books. Mm -hmm. Claude, what kind of advice um, can the experts come up with that Amplatz did not consider uh, when it did go through its own restructuring process? 
It's a, it's a good question. It's a difficult one because we are not there in their heads and we didn't participate in the, in the process of uh, strategic analysis and deliberation on how they would take it forward. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, um, we knew that they would have to come together at some point. Remember, we, sp we spoke about that last yes. week and that they would, you know, cooler head would have to prevail. It seems that we are getting through that process. Um, in terms of what could have been managed better, I, I'm not quite clear um, that there is an understanding uh, or sufficient understanding, but this is going to solve that mm -hmm. now. Um, A, on the part of government and the unions of how serious the situation is um, in, in South Africa right now in terms of the crisis affecting mining industry. And two, I'm not quite sure that the mining industry uh, understands how much the political economy of South Africa has changed in the past five mm -hmm. years and that the assumptions that they've had about the structure of power, the role of the ANC, the relationship within the ANC and government, policies, mm -hmm. expectations, and obviously the whole social environment, which has become explosive and very tense. How much that is impacting their ability to do business as usual? Uh, Dr. Abidin, let me bring you in here. The issues that Claude raised uh, goes to the nub of the matter. Mm -hmm. Obviously, all businesses must make profit, must run profitably. But government also cannot walk away from its imperatives. It so has a target on job creation. It's already had to revise that target down. Um, Five million jobs by 2014. It feels very, very... Um, betrayed in a sense by the mining company in, in question here. Both have a different imperatives. Is there a win-win in this situation given the fact that profitability doesn't always mean job creation. In very many cases it means um, cutting jobs. I think there are two issues. One is um, um, very early and continuous communication. In, in conditions that we all know, and Claude very ably uh, uh, depicted it, and business has to be super sensitive, that the government has to do everything on, in their power and to be seen to be doing everything in their power to save jobs or because they cannot create jobs. Mm -hmm. So that's one lesson that clearly has come out. And almost not to disregard of the law, but over and above the law, mm -hmm. we need to invoke a, nation, a sense of uh, commitment to the national welfare and show and express through a multi-party arrangements uh, continuous commitment to it. So I think that's, that's one lesson. The second issue that's come up, and it will come up more and more as, uh, as the mining industry gets into more of a difficulty as, as time goes by, is that some of the global benchmarks for uh, uniform rate of returns have to, to be re-looked at. Mm -hmm. For example, a shaft may be in a, within a corporate structure provide 5% um, real return as opposed to the average required maybe 12%. Mm -hmm. So by global return on equity standard, that shaft is, is dragging the returns down. And sometimes it may go as low as 1% real, real return. Now for, for a company it may not make sense, for the country it does. Mm -hmm. So we, we got to increasingly nuance the, the process of uh, restructuring, uh, give early warning, be a lot more open and transparent about how we go about deciding what closes, when it closes, and why it closes, and so on and so forth. If I understand Dr. Abedian correctly, Claude, he's talking about the tone of the debate, mm. that process is all important. Um, but how realistic is um, process if uh, one um, takes your point of view mm. that suggests that the two parties are unable mm. to put themselves in each other's shoes? That's right. And you know, we've been limping from crisis to crisis. And I, I'm not very optimistic to tell you the truth. I hear what you say, Raj, mm. uh, about being able to make a different economic calculus about what's happening in, in the mining industry in South Africa. But at the same time, we have to be realistic. South Africa is part of global commodities and mm. global investment capital flows. It's a country that is enormously dependent on foreign inflows of capital. And all of this is telling the investment community that South Africa's social risk and political risk is probably too high. So when you have a situation where that perception is negative, the expectation on the return of investment is even greater. Mm -hmm. The discount rate is even greater. What worries me, sorry, just to, what worries me about this is that a lot of investors are going to look at South Africa and say, but, but this is, they're going to look at this and say, this case tells us that over and above mm. the law, we have to now enter a political process whereby our freedom of trading and investing and making strategic decisions are going to be subservient to 
political imperatives which are not formulated in law but and can var vary from leadership to leadership, from moment to moment, and that's unsustainable. But, but if one, uh, to be fair to, mm. to, to governments, and not just governments in South Africa, governments the world over, the South African government is not the only government that talks very tough with the private mm. sector on a number of issues. We've had a case in France where you had two very different presidents, Sarkozy and now Hollande, taking a very hard line, Sarkozy with the banks, Hollande with Mittal, in fact, um, over the very same question. So this is not unique to South Africa, Dr. Abidian. Why is it that when we look at South Africa as an investment destination, often the problems that are prevalent in other economies in the world are seen as unique or make or break factors? How much of that got to do with real market sentiment or prejudice? I think uh, Australia, by the way, had a, even a more interesting case uh, when super tax was announced and government was changed, a completely different attitude. And nobody ran away. Uh, but, uh, but there were a lot of fears and there were a lot of jitter. Uh, they didn't run away, they didn't have enough time. So I think all of that points to the fact that globally, not just in South Africa, globally the terms of social license for operation is changing. In France it's changing one thing, Australia another, in Canada has already changed, and so is South Africa. What matters is not the fact that uh, investors don't understand the environment. Governments got to manage this a lot more uh, in a stately manner. Investors have no problem if government says, look, these are the steps that we want to do, these are the terms of engagement in our land, but then stick to it. It's the chop and change and the unpredictability and uh, almost a shock to the, to the system that investors don't like. And the tone, I think, uh, that yeah, the, the, the tone. manner in which it's managed, it, 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 it's happening, it, it does not appear to be managed. I, it's I, want, to challenge, I want to yeah. challenge your notion, Claude. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. When, when the controversy first started, mm. uh, government was seen as um, wielding a big stick, uh, bullying, that everyone mm. is going to be scared. Mm. And yet a week after all that rhetoric, what we see now is a willingness on the part of AMPLATS mm. to put the restructuring process on hold, to engage in the very process that government had asked uh, the company to engage in from the beginning. Now, why was that not followed right from the start, Claude? You know, and doesn't yeah. it prove that if you do bring the big stick, you can bring people to the table? Yeah, and you know, I I love the fact that you're bringing my country of origin, France, in the picture because <laughs> I can then draw the parallel. The reality is that in France, what do we have? We have a very, very defensive labor force environment, the highest cost of labor in Europe now, and a systematic loss of manufacturing capacity. And yes, obviously, government does what government has to do, which is to take side of the employees, a nationalistic you know, uh, standpoint. We will resist the, you know, in this case, Mittal, and we will force them to not shut down, etc. But does that actually solve the problem? Mm. You know, it's one step, it's a small victory for a great defeat. It's winning battles and losing the economic war in which France is engaged and frankly South Africa is engaged. And I actually see a lot of parallels between those two countries. Mm -hmm. The same kind of nationalistic rhetoric, uh, statist, and an unwillingness it seems to understand what is at stake when one engages in those kind of wars, economic battles, let's say not wars. To come back to this particular case, Yes, I am no doubt that government will be able to obtain significant concessions and a deal will be found with a lowered social, economic and political cost for the country in the short term. Mm -hmm. But what it's going to say to the other mining companies, you've got to think twice, thrice, four times before you hire a single worker, you open a single shaft and you get into business in South Africa. Dr. Bidin, do you share that view? I, 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 I think it's the conventional view and I, I know it, we, we've heard it, and it does make sense. At, however, if you're in a position that South Africa is with respect to platinum and manganese and so on, South Africa's got a short-term problem and a medium to long-term problem. What we need to learn both on the side of business and government is that we are, into it, we are in it together. Mm -hmm. If we mismanage, whether business mismanages or government mismanages, the result is the same. Yeah. We cannot get the national interest going. So yes, if government continues this sort of ad hoc, heavy-handed way, it will chase investment away. But if you want platinum, you've got to be in the next 60, 70 years in South Africa. And government has to say, under what regime will South Africa extract maximum social benefit? from the wealth that we have and clearly the track that we are on now which mm -hmm. is left to individual mining houses is not going to deliver. South Africa needs in my view much like what we had 
once upon a time for gold, we need to put a commodity exchange in place where business knows what the terms are, government knows what the terms are, information is available three, four, five years ahead of time, not six months and three months. So that's where we got to go. Um, this conventional approach, uh, and I agree with you, Claude, at the moment it has frightened the investors, but they're not going to go find in, uh, platinum elsewhere. Mm -hmm. If they run to Australia or Canada or France, they won't find platinum. So we have a bigger issue here to deal with. Claude, let's look at the kind of lessons that one mm. can draw from mm. this uh, exchange. Um, you've uh, predicted quite a gloomy outlook for mining mm. as a sector. What is the lessons that we can take from here um, involving the behavior of both parties mm. that should be avoided when we're looking at sectors like gold um, or even coal and steel? Well, I think, uh, Iraj, has, I, I agree with you, Iraj. Obviously, we need some sort of a new compact. Uh, and we need a new system to administer that compact. Um, the key question is, let's work together to save the mineral rent. Mm -hmm. You know, if there is no mineral rent, because the mining companies don't make money operating, there is no rent to be shared. Mm -hmm. That's the key. How do we get there from in terms of the other industries? I think we know the model. I mean, the gold industry model works very well for this, okay. this country. What we need to have is some sort of a policy system that allows government and the mining industry and labor to make commitments, to make responsible commitments in the long term that are based on some understanding of what happens to the rent. The only variable that counts, in my view, as a political economist, is the size of the rent. Mm -hmm. The size of the rent is the pie that needs to be shared. How it gets shared, I mean, we, we, we can agree on these things, provided there is reasonable return for all of the social partners, domestic and international, so that we can still have investment and we can grow the pie, that's great. And usually it's a matter of you know, marginal returns for everybody at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. We're not always far off from that. What we need is a policy dispensation that allows us to give enough returns to the investor when prices go down and they can restructure in a socially constructive the mines that need to be restructured. And when the rent grows up, it allows a greater part of that return to go to labor, mm -hmm. to go to communities, to go to government in form of rents, uh, ta rent taxes. And I'm not against a mineral rent tax at all, provided it is progressive and provided it is truly a mineral rent tax and not an additional profit tax or income tax. Uh, gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to be Sangomas. We've got the mining in Dava coming up next week. All the players are going to be gathered. It's an important gathering. It's an opportunity that everyone looks at to give an idea of where government and both industry is, is looking at. Dr. Abidian, what do you think are going to be the most critical issues that the mining in Dava will have to deal with? I think the issues that we discussed, the minister is expected to come out and uh, calm the nerves, uh, put in context what happened. Uh, anglo plat and Anglo-American is expected to come out and also calm the nerves on the side of the investors that this is not uh, heaven falling and, and, and the, the world ending. Mm -hmm. It was a, a miscommunication, a bit of a misreading on all fronts, and we need to learn from it and move on. And I'm very excited by the prospects of mining, but this incident and a couple of other incidences, unfortunate incidences that we have had over the past few months, shows that the old way of running business is not going to work. 30 seconds, Claude. Well, you know, uh, I'm tempted to say that the Indaba is not so much about South Africa anymore, uh, and it hasn't been for quite some time. Uh, you know, it's, it's an environment where the juniors come and smell what's happening in Africa. I think over there, too, there are some problems. We've seen what's happening in Mozambique with infrastructure mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. Overall, I think the consensus will be that there is trouble in mining in Africa, and we need something new.